Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone P. Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, newly elected leaders take the oath of office and prepare to take on major challenges. Utah's congressional delegation is divided during a contentious week confirming the 2020 presidential election results. And state legislators gear up for the upcoming session as new bills are released and major policy issues take shape. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Chris Karpowitz, professor of political science at Brigham Young University, Holly Richardson, editor of utahpolicy.com, and Lindsay Whitehurst, reporter with the Associated Press. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Unprecedented uh, events happening in Washington, D.C., in our country. And Chris, I want to start with you. A joint session of Congress met, which was for a, a constitutionally provided ceremony where you confirmed the results of the states, um, which normally has been a day which can be done very quickly. Everything disrupted uh, by protesters, people storming uh, the Capitol, including the Senate chambers. Talk about the historical context of what we just saw happen in Washington, D.C. Well, we've never seen anything like this. Um, it, this is, as you indicated, Jason, typically a perfunctory. It's typically something that allows us to emphasize the constitutional uh, provisions for electing a president. Often losers have, or not often, but occasionally losers have had to announce their own loss, as in the case of uh, Al Gore, for example, um, or Walter Mondale. That, uh, so that's not what happened this time. Uh, instead of this being an opportunity to emphasize the, the peaceful transfer of power, we had disruption at the Capitol, we had rioters. Um, ultimately, the process did conclude, but it's in no way like anything we've ever seen before. Yeah, so Drew, Holly, I, I never thought I'd see the time, having worked in Washington, D.C. myself, where you see someone storm the Senate chamber, sit in the chair of the Senate president. I, I know you've talked to a lot of people in Utah since all this happened. What is the feel for people about what they saw? I think most people are pretty disturbed, right? I think I think even people who have been pretty pro President Trump, uh, not this, right? This is way too far. Um, it I, I think it really cuts at the heart of the democracy, right? And what we're built on. We are a country that's built on the peaceful transition of power and accepting the will of the people. And and I think th that at least the sentiment that I've heard is this is really disturbing. Yeah. So Lindsay, I think this is such an interesting point. I know you've done a lot of stories on this. You've been interviewing people also. So well. well Holly said, I'm just curious if this is what you're hearing, is there was segments of our population, particularly in the Republican Party, talking about in Utah, you had mainstream Republicans, you have very conservative Republicans, and you had the sort of always Trump uh, Republicans in the state as well. Ha have those lines blurred? Has that, that one always Trump changed a little bit in who you're talking to, where maybe this was the moment where kind of the, the house of cards fell a bit? I think... There, it was a watershed moment for a lot of people. I think that um, that certainly a lot of a lot of folks were were rethinking their um, their support and their positions a little bit. Of course, there was still that segment of people who who are, are going to stay the course, so to speak. You know, we, we saw that it, right before all of this happened. We saw that in that airport confrontation with with Mitt Romney, um, somebody who um, I think still still has a long time popularity in Utah, but but certainly um, from from a, a not insignificant segment of folks is is sort of a enemy number one. Right. And 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 does does endure these things even from sort of regular Joe's when people are minding their own business, when he's kind of doing his own thing in the airport. So so there are going to be. And, and of course, that happened right before all of this. And and all of a sudden had a little bit different context. Right. An airport yeah. confrontation looked a little bit different when people were storming the Capitol, but certainly is an indication of of that anger and frustration that that remains among some people. And and you would you would hope this is a moment that we can, it really comes home when we talk about lack of civility. We don't just mean conversations with each other, right? We mean that, but we also mean 
not exploding into, you know, uh, violence and vandalism in, in our most hallowed um, halls as, as Americans. You know what I mean? Yeah. So interesting what you right. brought up, because I, I want to get to our elected officials. Go ahead, Chris. No, I think that's what Lindsay is saying is exactly right, that um, politics is the way we peacefully deal with our disagreements. So there are going to be disagreements, but understanding and embracing and supporting the Constitution is primarily about supporting the institutions we have for dealing with those disagreements. And so this was really a radical departure from, from all of that. And it, and it, it highlights the, the importance of political leadership uh, because what we've seen is a political party uh, uh, in, in the Republicans who at least some segments of that party ha have, have tried to amplify and whip up the anger and frustration that are felt in some parts of the, uh, uh, of the base. And what we see was that that sort of behavior has costs. Um, and, and, and that was illustrated in, in deadly fashion uh, this week. Yeah. So Holly, he talks about the political leadership because we have to talk about the Utah perspective sure. because Utahns and our elected officials were on full display uh, in this whole process. When you talk about people who were involved in it, our own Senator Mitt Romney, uh, Lindsay just talked about this for a second, acc accosted in the airport on his way to Washington, D.C. People thought, wow, that's not great, but it turns out there's a little bit of foreshadowing yeah. about what was to come. But I, I want to read a quote from Senator Romney because many in the country are talking about this floor speech um, that he gave and the impacts. And I want to get I want to get all of your take on this because there are lots of important threads, particularly when it comes to the state of Utah. Uh, Senator Romney said, and this was on the floor of the Senate, we gather due to a selfish man's injured pride and the outrage of supporters who he had deliberately misinformed for the past two months and spurred to action this very morning. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. Those who choose to continue to support this dangerous gambit by objecting to the results of a legitimate and democratic election will forever be seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack against our democracy. Well, wow, that was pretty sharp. Yeah. Particularly when we have a couple members of our own delegation that voted against the results. I don't. I don't think that um, Mitt Romney is wrong. I think he's right. I think he's correct. And I think uh, to Lindsay's point just a little bit ago, there is still a segment of population that is um, st continues to stay pro-Trump, continues to believe that the election was stolen, continues to say we're going to you know fight our way into having the country that we want instead of accepting um, the way we've done things for more than 200 years. But I think I think Mitt Romney's right, right? And I think that he has he has consistently been one who has stood up and said this is. Not not right this is right this is the way we should do things right and he just he pulled no punches um, late Wednesday night right he just didn't and and I think he has he still has people who call him traitor number one enemy number one but there are a lot of people who say maybe he's become the conscience of the Republican Party and we've kind of been lacking one yeah I'm curious about that talk about the evolution up to this point Chris because um, I, I know you you've researched and, and studied Mitt Romney and his politics for a while. Uh, you, you may recall he gave a, a, a pretty serious speech even at the University of Utah for the Hinckley Institute um, in 2016, uh, where there were some shades of this then. Is, is it the same theme from Senator Romney or is it a bigger import, maybe as, as Holly was just suggesting? Well, in 2016, he was uh, trying to warn Republicans and Americans generally about what we might expect with uh, a Trump presidency. Many aspects of the things that he predicted seem to have uh, come true. We're now at the end of a Trump administration, and what we're seeing is um, you know, the, the way that administration is unraveling. To me, one of the most important things that he said from the floor of the Senate uh, this week was that the way we restore faith in our institutions is to tell our constituents the truth. And, and to me, that's a divide that's occurring in the Republican Party. Mitt Romney has said 
the way we go forward is to be honest about what happened in the election. And the honest answer is that there is no evidence of widespread fraud of a size that would change the outcome of the election. And, and there are others who have wanted to sort of indulge and engage the worries and fears of the base instead of telling them the truth. And so I think the through line that I see in Mitt Romney is a willingness to uh, say what he thinks about Donald Trump and about uh, the character of Donald Trump. He certainly seemed willing to you know, to, to have these kinds of statements his whole time in office as Senator Romney, this seems to have a, a even bigger impact once given the context of what had just happened. But we, let's talk about some of our ele other elected officials, Lindsey. Um, so Senator Mike Lee uh, did not voice objection, and he, he talk about what he said his role was, because even though he didn't give a speech like Mitt Romney, he was in the same camp. And, and he, up until then, he was a little bit of a question mark, right? Like, we had had some public statements from, from folks like Representative John Curtis, who, who said, I'm not going to object. And, and Mike Lee, there had been some rumblings that he, he probably wouldn't and that he was, he, but it was a little more under the radar. He hadn't, like, put out that kind of public statement ahead of time in, in, that, same, in that same kind of way. And, of course, he's been um, probably a, strong, a little bit stronger supporter of President Trump. He's, he's typically a little more aligned with, with Senator Cruz, Ted Cruz, who was, who was pushing that in the Senate. So it was, it was a little little bit of a question mark, and I think um, he had said even after all of the um, the mob came in, he he was pretty quick on Twitter to say we got to get back and finish our mm -hmm. work, and 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 that that may have been in part because he was ready to make his his statement. He was ready to 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 really let people know what, what he was thinking about this in a in a way that he hadn't up until that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, you you did see him come out stronger and say nope, this is this is the democratic norms. We're sticking with this. This is um, it's also been painted as sort of a state rights thing like like yeah, hey we exactly. this is not our job as Congress and the federal government to to come in and say states you to tell them how to run their business you know and I think that's that is a, typically a core value I think for a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. is, is is states rights and states you know making their own decisions for for their own folks so um, so that was another way the issue was seen by a lot of people yeah so it's an interesting point because that's what Senator Lee said right Holly is like hey can you imagine Congress coming in and overturning right Utah's election Utah's for election example, right so so I, I think one of the things, too, that Senator Lee did that was um, w when he did his five minute speech, I mean, he said, we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to count the vote. That's it. Mm -hmm. there, there's like seven words in the Constitution that says what your role is, and we're not going to go beyond that. Um, he also, I think, um, was was pretty emphatic in his. Um, not objecting. Well, he objected to the objection. Is that right? That's, That's correct. right. Correct. So a double negative. So, so he was he was pretty emphatic in that. And I think I think that that is some some real signaling. Mm -hmm. I, I think to some of the base in Utah because yeah. he has been so tightly aligned he with has. Ted Cruz and and a Trump. But for him to come out and say we don't have the right as the federal government to overturn another state's election or to even really question their process. That's up to each state to do that. I mean, I thought that was powerful, and I think that will resonate with yeah. um, some of his supporters here. It seems, it seems accurate. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. No, that's it. I think what Holly says is exactly right. I think Mike Lee has a way of communicating with and, and an ability to communicate with different segments of the Republican Party than, say, Mitt Romney, uh, for reasons that we've been talking about. Um, so, so the fact that Mike Lee set, uh, broke with Ted Cruz and said that uh, this is the constitutional process is, is a really key uh, point, it seems to me, very strong. Mm -hmm. So let's just hit a couple of our other representatives because uh, you, you mentioned, Lindsey, uh, Congressman Curtis all along was pretty emphatic about not being willing to go along with the objections. But we did have two members, Congressman uh, Stewart and Congressman uh, Burgess Owens, who's been there since Sunday, I guess, along. Um, those are two people who did object to uh, Pennsylvania. They did not object to the results in Arizona, but to Pennsylvania. What was their argument? that you heard. 
Well, Stewart especially, I think he he spoke a little bit in more detail um, than than Representative Owens did, and he he talked about it as as almost a way to um, to increase confidence in the in the institutions. He had sort of this interesting take on it where he both referred to President-elect Biden, but then also said, "But we have to object in order to make." It. So it was yeah. it was a little bit. Uh, he was he was kind of making the argument that that by by doing this we can we can have an audit and that will increase confidence in in these. Results. It was that was almost the justification, which I think for for a decent number of people was a little bit, um, a little pretzel-like. How it kind of came back and 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 it was almost as if saying by undermining confidence we're going to increase confidence. So I think there were some people who sort of sort of took it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that that Stewart was a little bit a little bit less. Um, Ideological about it, he was almost made a process or argument, but I'm not. I'm not totally sure that 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 flew with a lot of people. He almost tried to have it, sort of tried to go down the middle with it, almost. And I don't know if there's a middle ground here. Mm -hmm. go ahead, Holly. So I listened to the arguments um, late into the night on Wednesday, and the arguments they were making is basically um, Pennsylvania did not follow their own election law, right? There, what what the argument was is the Utah, or not the Utah, <laughs> the Pennsylvania yeah. legislature is supposed to make election law, but when there was a question, it was the Secretary of State and the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania who was who were making decisions on the election. I think what these um, objectors refuse to acknowledge is that there have been multiple lawsuits, including yeah. over um, in, in multiple states, including Georgia, but also in Pennsylvania. And, and they've gone not only to the state Supreme Court, but to the federal Supreme Court. And there is no standing. There's like there's nothing there. And continuing to beat that dead horse. I think is super damaging, and it's really disappointing to me that we've had two um, congressmen from Utah who jumped on that mm -hmm. bandwagon. So yeah, let, we, let's don't, we don't increase our confidence in our system of government by undermining confidence in it, right? <laughs> and as Mike Lee pointed out, if there were problems in Pennsylvania, the right forum for that was the Pennsylvania legislature and the courts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and every one of the lawsuits um, was thrown out for either issues of standing or for lack of evidence. And so it's a really hard argument to make, it seems to me, um, from Chris Stewart and Burgess Owens, that they are somehow standing up for the Constitution by um, departing from our constitutional norms and traditions. Mm -hmm. Holly, do you think there's going to be any ramifications for Stewart or Owens in Utah, or is it so, just even divided between the two of them? So vo voters have um, short memories, <laughs> so and the next election cycle is two years away. I mean, not really; it already started, but. Um, I don't know. We'll see. I, I, again, I think there are people who are sticking with that that mm -hmm. that really hard line. I, I wonder if we're going to see a break off from the Republican Party and maybe the formation of a third party from people who were more on the Trump train. I, I don't. I really don't know. Um, so so I don't know. Okay, if have we'll watch that closely. Yes, we'll see. <laughs> no, President Trump is not going away as a political yeah. force, right? right. It, from from all appearances right now, I think even in his most recent video where he did acknowledge a transfer of power, if not a full concession uh, he right. didn't use that word but um, but I, I think at the end of that he he even said this is just the beginning right. um, so so he's so at, at the moment at least he appears to be full steam ahead is going to continue to be a political force yeah. in in our in our nation's politics yeah. uh, so as just one last piece on the national side uh, Chris uh, normally we would be spending a lot of time talking about the Georgia races, right? So the, uh, but you know, that's kind of lost and all this happened this week, but uh, the Senate has, has flipped. Uh, you know, it's 50-50 plus one for the vice president with the deciding vote. Uh, all members of the Utah delegation now in the minority party. Um, yes. imp implications for Utah. Well, I, I do think it matters that, uh, you know, Republicans are no longer in the majority. Uh, it is a very uh, thin margin in the Senate. It couldn't be any closer. It's li literally 50-50 with uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, going to be the uh, deciding vote or the tie-breaking mm -hmm. vote. And so uh, what that means, I think, is that people who are willing to compromise, to work across party lines, 
actually have a, a significant amount of power. So I'm, I'm looking especially to Mitt Romney and to see what he does. I think he's in a unique position to broker uh, agreements across those party lines in a very closely divided Senate. Mm -hmm. in, in the House, I think that's harder. I think you're in the minority party and, and that's just going to be a, a different situation. But again, there, the, the Democrats' margin is not great and there may be creative opportunities for people in the minority party to make a difference. Yeah, some great points. Uh, let's get to some very local races. Uh, Holly, you were at the inauguration for our brand new governor. I was. Governor Spencer Cox and our, our Lieutenant Governor. Talk about that event and just got some key takeaways from those speeches and it was right. a little unique also, right? Unprecedented even in the format. It, it was and I, I think that's, you know, the word of the, I don't know, maybe the decade, unprecedented. Yes. So <laughs> so because, because of um, COVID-19, they did not have a traditional at the Capitol big hoopla. What they did is they went to Tuacan in St. George, just outside of St. George, and they did an outdoor ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, it was very limited in the number of people there. Everybody was separated. Um, everybody was masked. N you, in fact, you had to be COVID tested the day before to show a negative test to even be able to get in. And so that was something different. The, the other thing that was super different is that Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson is the first mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor to give an inaugural speech. So I, I loved her speech. I thought she did a great job. She addressed um, answerable courage, which is something that her 11th great grandfather, who was William Bradford, um, spoke of as he wrote his memories of Plymouth Plantation. Mm -hmm. um, and then Spencer Cox, I mean, so they're both forward looking, they're both aspirational. And Spencer Cox spent a fair amount of time talking about not only the difficulties that we've just come through, but the goodness of people in Utah and pulling together. And I think, I mean, I think they set the right, the right note. It certainly seems like they did. A any key indicators you saw, Lindsay, in these speeches about what we're going to see in this administration? I think that it'll be really interesting. First of all, of course, historic gains for women across the board. And um, and uh, Deirdre Henderson is not our first female lieutenant governor, but still, she's she's um, definitely been a presence at the Capitol for a long time. And um, and so she'll be a really interesting one to watch, along with Governor Cox, who um, is a moderate, has been a Trump critic in the past, and um, and has has softened that a little bit, supported him right this last time mm -hmm. around. Um, and uh, but but still does speak a lot about about political division about the Republican Party and its future. So it's, it'll be a little bit interesting to see if moderates like him and, and moderate not only perhaps not as moderate in political positions, but in his style and his tone. Right. Um, it'll be interesting to see if if politicians like that start to come to the fore. What Republican Party is going to do with politicians like him? Does that style start to be something that becomes more popular now, you know, a move away from the sort of more pugnacious kind of style of a President Trump to something that, that you know, definitely in terms of, of rhetoric and speech is much more conciliatory and much more wanting wanting to, to work. Is, is, is that going to be the tone going forward for part of the Republican Party where people look mm -hmm. to folks like that? Or will it be more of like, you know, doubling down on, on President President Trump and and um, and his his style and the things he stands for. That's going to be a really interesting question, I think, going forward in the next few totally years. Totally true. Chris may comment on that too, because it is a different style, different tone, very different approach. I think uh, Spencer Cox has uh, the chance to um, uh, to chart a new course, as Lindsay says, for the Republican Party, um, certainly at the state level, to represent a different kind of republicanism than what we've seen um, from the Trump administration. I also agree that uh, Deirdre Henderson is uh, a really talented and an important figure at the state level. The relationship between the governor's office the lieutenant governor's office and the and the legislature will be something important to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and I see uh, Deirdre Henderson as someone who can uh, communicate well between more conservative elements of the legislature and the perhaps at least more moderate style of uh, the Cox administration. So that will be something I think to watch going forward. Mm -hmm. Of course, anyone watching the show, you can you can catch the whole ceremony, pbsutah.org, as everyone should. These are speeches that are worth worth watching. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Holly, what you see for this legislative session coming, because it's it's unique when you have Spencer Cox and Deidre Henderson, both former members of the legislature 
legislature. How is that shaping the policy going into a very interesting legislative session? Well, the governor's office doesn't um, have as much influence as sometimes people would like to say that they do. They do have policy discussions. They can help set direction. They propose a budget, but of course it's the legislature that passes that budget. Um, I think what we're going to see this this year, we're going to really see some discussions on on budget because of the economic downturn. We're going to see discussions on COVID-19 and um, maybe increase in communication between the governor's office and the legislature on that issue. Um, we've got some concealed carry bills that are yes. coming up. We always have some kind of an abortion bill that comes up at least once. Um, and then uh, Senator Henderson at the time, now Lieutenant Governor Henderson, had, had a real issue with an, a bill last year during the legislative session. I'm um, dealing with having um, uh, early ultrasounds for women who were choosing abortion. And I think that bill will come back and we'll see where that goes. So I think there's some interesting things to watch. Well, that's a pretty good list. Uh, <laughs> you, you've just given Holly. There's, there's always sleeper bills, too, where you're just like, I have no idea yeah. where that came from. <laughs> this, this time of year, we start seeing them. I'll, I'll come forward. Uh, it, it, when it comes to the money, anything in particular you're seeing, Lindsay? Well, of course, we don't have as much of it, and that's yeah. never a good thing, right? And I think education is going to be a really interesting conversation, too. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about, about teachers and um, being in the classroom themselves or remote, and, and that's, that's going to be, perhaps that conversation might continue into the session, perhaps we can wrap it up before then, but, um, but that's, that's a really important one. Funding for education right. is going to be a big one. It doesn't sound like that Amendment G that some, some right. of the education funding could be used for other sources. That might not help, actually happen this time around, but I think all those conversations about, about money and, and education will be really interesting this year. Well, it's so interesting to see that coming. This is the biggest part of that budget, this Constitution Amendment, to see how that plays. But uh, as they always say, when you have lots of one-time money, sometimes that's even harder than having no money. So I can't wait to see what happens there. Thank you all for being on the show. It's so insightful, and we're grateful for, um, for your comments. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.